Hello and welcome back to another lecture in our English 332 class in business uh, writing in the professions covering uh, business, business and administrative communication. Uh, this is chapter six where we're talking about design documents or document design. It's one of the uh, my favorite topics and it's also a topic that tends to get uh, undercut or not fully appreciated in a lot of writing classes because we are talking here about the look and feel of documents rather than the content or the text and the writing of a document but I think they're equally important just as important to be able to design well as it is to write well if you are to succeed in the world of business communications or pretty much any professional communication situation so it's a very important topic and I think it's a lot of fun I think we'll have some fun with this uh, hopefully you will enjoy it uh, anyway uh, we do have a lot to cover so let's jump in all right, so let's take a look at our learning object objectives, uh, what document design is important, and how to incorporate it into the writing process. I think that should probably probably be why document design is important. Uh, there we go again. Maybe these book these uh, PowerPoint authors should go back and read their chapter on <laughs> proofreading. Uh, the four levels of document design. Uh, that'll give us some terminology to use when we get into this. Uh, some basic guidelines uh, we'll talk about brochures which is probably one of the most common types of printed business communications uh, everything from marketing to probably you got some brochures when you were applying for, for uh, uh, to colleges right how to design infographics lots of fun love these infographics you see, you see them all over campus now uh, how to design web pages another great topic i know a lot of you folks are into computers and uh, information systems and whatnot so you might have already designed some web pages but uh, we'll be approaching it not from a coding programming perspective here but from again the look and feel of that interface uh, the way that the document or the website looks and controls and let's see what else basic usability testing on your documents so usability huge another huge thing all this stuff is so marketable by the way you know, if you're not sure what you want to do for a career or how you might make some money <laughs> applying skills, uh, web page design, usability testing, both of those are just huge. Just so many companies are looking for people that can do this kind of work. Uh, you know, and not just for making it look nice, uh, but making it look accessible, especially for people with uh, disabilities. Uh, they're just really underserved. There's a huge demand for it. Uh, so I just want to kind of emphasize these, these last two great career options. It's not so hard to do and it's lots of uh, actual demand uh, for those skills. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, go into this. All right, so let's start by talking about why design matters. And I just want to use the example here of a restaurant menu. So let's just say you're going to a nice restaurant. It's one you've never been to before. And the uh, server comes out and hands you that menu. So try to imagine just a menu and what, what it might look like and then in, in the context of why design matters. So the first point is a good design saves time and money. So it's not hard to think about that uh, menu again. If it's a, if it's a well-designed menu, you'll be able to figure out what it is you want to order quickly. That'll save time. Uh, and by extension, of course, the money, because you won't have to have that server tied up there for as long. Uh, you won't have to have that table uh, sitting there uh, for as long. You'll be able to get the food out faster, get the table cleaned out so <laughs> other customers can come in. Uh, so that's all just in terms of just having a, a well-designed menu. Uh, reducing legal problems. Again, we could think about that menu. If somebody has a food allergy, if there's some type of ingredient that they're uh, sensitive to, or maybe they're uh, on a strict diet, whatever it is, Again, if it's really clear, if you have a really a well-designed menu, they'll be able to see, well, that I shouldn't order that. It has, uh, you know, a peanut in it. Uh, this other thing might have a MSG in it. <laughs> you know uh, what I'm talking about there. Uh, so if it's poorly designed, though, they might not be able to get to that information. There may be some tiny print. They can't even read it. Uh, and you might end up being sued. Uh, building goodwill. Uh, another one of these, these topics that keeps coming up again. Uh, people appreciate it. Right? If you go to a restaurant and and you know you're going to be paying uh, some big money to eat there and they bring out this crummy looking typed uh, typed out printed out menu it's just misspellings 
uh, but for uh, more important for the, these purposes, maybe it's uh, just all kind of clumped together. It's small print. It just looks cheesy. Uh, that you might actually start thinking that you're going to get ripped off at that restaurant, right? That it's they don't take uh, customer service seriously. Uh, just based on a menu uh, again so let's you know you could have a great server great chefs there everything uh spiffy but it, it, just that document design <laughs> of the menu uh, can tarnish uh, your goodwill towards that restaurant uh, looks inviting friendly easy to read and again if you think about a, a restaurant like tgi fridays or buffalo wild wings uh, places like that uh, you sit down there, you, they, they hand you that menu, and you, you kind of want to just dive into it, right? It's It's got lots of uh, color pictures in there, <laughs> inviting. Uh, they don't talk, uh, it doesn't strike you as necessarily as being um, stodgy or, or too serious. You know, they have a little fun with the menu. It's easy to navigate that menu. You know, what are the appetizers? Uh, well, that's easy to find that. Uh, what if you're looking for uh, healthy options? Again, they have all that laid out nicely, easy to find, and it uh, you know it, it makes you feel better about eating there. Enhances the credibility of the writer. So this is the the key I was talking about before. Uh, even if you're a great writer, you know you have perfect grammar skills, everything's spelled correctly, uh, good or uh, good paragraphing, you name it. All of that stuff goes out the window if the design of the menu is poor. So again, if everything is, maybe it's just nothing but text, it's all uh, lined up, uh, that's not going to be a very good design for a menu, right? You want to have, if at the very least, headings like appetizers, main dishes, sides, uh, maybe a dessert menu. And you want to pay, pay attention to how these design, uh, all of this is laid out, right? And where the pictures are going to go, uh, how many pictures you're going to have, how many pages is it going to be? Maybe the size of the menu too, right? Do you want to hand people this huge newspaper size <laughs> menu? It's just going to blow them away. Uh, you probably don't want that, right? You want something that's, again, inviting, friendly, easy to read. Now, so all of this just in the context of a menu, but you could apply that. You could apply this to resumes, obviously. You could apply this to pamphlets, brochures, websites, as we'll see. Uh, but anyway, hopefully the point is, is coming home now, how important this is, why design matters. All right, so let's jump into uh, the design in terms of writing it. And what we want to do is get away from this idea of a one-stop shop or just a, you, you do all this in one big whoop, and there's the document. Uh, instead, you want to think about different steps, and you want to evolve this design as you step through a process. Of course, the first step is to plan it. And we do that by thinking about the audience. Are they skilled? Uh, do, how much do they know about the subject matter? Are they busy? Are they going to reach straight through it or are they going to skip around? And again, I think this idea of a menu is great. And I'm going to throw uh, something else out at you here. I think about a restaurant uh, that has uh, two different menus, right? They have a lunch menu and then they have the dinner menu. And you might wonder, why do they need two different menus? Well, uh, come back to this idea about busyness. So if it's a lunch crowd, uh, restaurants uh, tend to get flooded with people and they, these people need to get in, get out, and they need to get back to work. Uh, so they just have a little short, maybe one page menu there uh, that's really quick to the point. Uh, probably doesn't have a lot of pictures on it. It's just like uh, you know, a couple of uh, standard dishes on it. And the idea is just, you know, you, you go in there, you get the, this little menu, you uh, quickly uh, gloss over it and make your order. Uh, people are busy now at dinner time though totally different situation you know somebody's coming in there with their family and friends they don't want to just come in and stay for 20 minutes and leave you know they might be there for an hour uh, maybe even up to two hours you know so this menu will be a lot more elaborate uh, because it's, it's kind of part of the fun right you want to spend some more time with the menu uh, you want to uh, savor it even <laughs> uh, and we could apply the skill there concept as well you, know, you think about diners uh, and how much would they know about the type of food that's available there. Uh, do you need to really uh, show a picture of the dish and explain what it is? Uh, or is it or is it somebody that's, uh, you know, I would say if, if it's like the Japanese steakhouse in town or an Indian restaurant in Minnesota, well, you, you shouldn't expect the, your client, typical customers, to be really skilled in the items that you're offering. 
Uh, so you have to do more explanation, more pictures, uh, a looser design, I guess, uh, than if it's you know typical Minnesotan fair. Uh, you, you don't need to tell somebody what a burger is, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Uh, and then reading uh, straight through and, and or skipping around. Obviously, with the menu, they're going to be skipping to uh, the you know, uh, main dish. Well, maybe you don't even need appetizer. You skip that. Uh, you don't want the dessert, etc. All right. As you write, use lists, headings. Uh, use visuals to convey uh, numerical data clearly. Uh, let's start with this first idea. So with the lists and headings, again, if we think about a menu, you've got uh, your appetizers. A little list there of appetizers, sides, a little list of sides. Uh, this is very typical. It's very rare to see a menu that's just in paragraph form. I don't think I've ever seen that. Uh, the, uh, using visuals to convey numerical data clearly. Uh, this An interesting way that I've seen this on restaurant menus is little pictures, right? So if it's, let's say you're trying to convey how hot a dish is. And there's these things they call Scov Scoville units. And it's actually a numerical system for saying, is well, is this how many Scoville units is this chili? <laughs> but only really uh, experts know anything about that. Uh, so instead, what they'll do is put little pictures of uh, habaneros, peppers there. This is terrible graphics. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they might say if it's just got the one pepper, that's kind of mild. If it's got three peppers, though, that's really hot. Or maybe they have little fire icons there. Uh, lined up. So anyway, uh, just ignore my terrible artwork here. <laughs> uh, but you get the idea, right? That'd be a way to make something numerical, like, well, that's two Scoville units. Uh, who knows what that means? Uh, if you see, though, that this one has three peppers on it, and this one has only one pepper, that, that helps you. That conveys that information clearly so that even total amateur uh, knows what you're talking about. Uh, getting feedback uh, from the audience. This is probably the most important step uh, because, uh, you know, in a restaurant, if it's a serious restaurant, they'll have a draft menu or sometimes they even bring their uh, staff in and say, okay, staff, today you're customers. Everybody come in. Uh, let's just start with the menu. Well, uh, what do you think? Uh, restaurants will also have uh, comment cards and customer surveys and all of this stuff. And it's all uh, about feedback. I don't think I've seen the one about menus, <laughs> uh, but I imagine when they were designing that menu, they would they went through these these uh, case studies and focus groups, bringing in people, giving them different kinds of menus. Uh, which one do you like better, right? Or maybe bring them bring them in two or three different times, two or three different menus, and uh, say, what do you like? Was it clear? Uh, you can give uh, people missions or quests. You could say, tell me, uh, how much is the uh, how much are the wings, uh, spicy wings? Can they get to that information quickly, or do they have to spend several minutes looking all over the menu? Uh, that's just different ways to get feedback. And you can use this information to go back in and redesign parts of it that are giving people trouble. And then as you revise, check the design guidelines uh, that follow. So we need to go to the next slide for that. All right, so here are some design conventions uh, first is to be aware of how uh, these change in terms of audience, the geographic area, uh, the industry. You know, we're talking about mainly the uh, restaurant or food industry here, uh, but a lot of the same stuff would apply to some extent to, say, the medical industry or the academic uh, university uh, or even the departments uh, within uh, a company. We talked a lot about engineering departments, uh, managerial staff. Uh, the uh, the CEOs, uh, or maybe the, the floor. I mean, these are all different departments. They'll have their own uh, convention. Uh, they talk about changing over time. Uh, think about even the st how stores change. If you think about the a Walmart or Target, uh, they look a lot different now than they did back uh, when I was a kid. And I don't know how old you are, but you, they, they probably changed in your lifetime as well. Uh, you can sort of go to a restaurant sometimes and you can, you're looking around and it just seems like it's kind of obsolete or everything seems old fashioned, kind of in major need of a facelift. And that's just talking about the restaurant, the decor, the, the look of the restaurant. Uh, but even that menu should change too, right? And it's a little subtle thing sometimes. Uh, different fonts will seem 
obsolete or uh, <laughs> clip art comes and goes. <laughs> I like to think about PowerPoints and it, uh, every time there's a new PowerPoint Microsoft rolls out, they have these different themes. And the, the goal of that is to try to make it look newer, right? So look, look a little hipper, a little savvier. Uh, if you're rocking that, one of those earlier versions of PowerPoint and you, and you got the chalkboard, the fireworks in the corner, uh, people look at that and they think, wow, you know, this is old information. You haven't updated this. Uh, time has moved on and you have not. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make a, a good impression. Uh, violating these conventions uh, can be risky. Uh, they give some examples in the book about a web design. And when you go to a website, you kind of expect to see a menu and, and headings and so on. And you might say, well, I want to be really artistic and really do something radical with my website design. Or you, you could do a thinking about a resume, right? And you say, I want my resume to be on like uh, fluorescent colored paper and I, I want to use really different kinds of fonts and I want to have a, a picture of a banana. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, kind of being silly there. Uh, but the idea is uh, you're risking, on, on the one hand, yeah, it's great. You're being original. You're being you're really expressing yourself well, etc. Uh, on the other hand, you might be taking a big risk. They might just look at this and say, oh, this person is just too far out there. Uh, there. I, I don't even know what what this is. Am I even looking at a resume? What What is this? And they might just chuck it in the trash. Uh, same thing with a website, right? If, if I'm on this website, yeah, it looks great, uh, but uh, something's supposed to be popping up there. Uh, I don't know what it is. It must be some huge graphic. It's taking too long to download, so uh, I'm, I'm going to just, you know, move on to the next website. I'm not even going to uh, stick around. Uh, so violating these conventions, and again, we, anything from a website will have conventions, resumes have conventions, uh, a brochure, any of them will have uh, conventions. And on the one hand, taking a risk can sometimes be great. It can show you're really trendy, you're on the cutting edge, etc. Uh, but <laughs> uh, maybe you want to play it safe. Yeah, incorrect interpretations. Uh, Signal's author is unreliable or unknowledgeable. Uh, I didn't really think about this one, but yeah, sometimes if you have this uh, website and it's instead of having your um, uh, menu over here where it usually is, maybe you got your menu at the bottom. And you say, well, I'm putting it at the bottom because, you know, I want to be different. Well, it, maybe people will look at that and think you're really cool <laughs> for being different. Uh, on the other hand, they might just say, well, this person, obviously, they, they must have never been to a website before. They, they don't know that its menu is supposed to go up there and, and down there, right, in that F shape. Uh, they got their stuff down at the bottom. Uh, maybe they're unknowledgeable. And if you think they don't know what they're talking about or they don't know what they're doing uh, with designing a website, maybe the service they offer is uh, questionable, too. They might, you might, they might start making all kinds of assumptions. So it's not just uh, being incorrect. It could be um, something more serious, uh, could even affect the reliability or how they perceive your reliability, your knowledgeability. Uh, so very serious stuff. All right, so here we're talking about the levels of design, and they, they give you four here. One's intra-level, uh, individual letters and words. Uh, so we can get in there and start looking at, you know, look at the fonts there. Uh, that looks like a sans serif font. We'll get into that. Um, looking at parallelism here, you see how they, they start these with after, 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 before, before, before. Uh, we can look at these little elements over here. And you're just kind of looking at words, even just the letters, right? So basically the fonts, you know, are things in italics or color. You notice this little web link here is blue. So just little stuff like that is intro. Uh, enter, though, is looking more in terms of blocks of text. Uh, so there we could say this is a block of text. Uh, this is a, it's a circle, but it's still kind of a block of text. Uh, then we have those blocks, right? Enter level. Uh, extra graphics that go with the text. And I can see two here. We've got these um, uh, people here at the top, a man and a boy there. It looks like they're Washing hands. <laughs> so the whole theme of this uh, sheet here is washing hands. So that makes perfect sense. Of course, you, that, that goes with the, the stuff, the content, 
You don't look at the picture and think, what the heck does that have to do with the text? No, it's clear. And then we have another image here. It looks like a, some block, or what is this, some, some bars of soap, <laughs> okay? Uh, that goes with the text. Uh, this is extra levels of design. Uh, and then we have the supra level, or I just would say the supra level, entire document. So we, we can look at the thing as a whole and see it's, it's kind of big and long. It looks kind of like a poster that would go up maybe in a bathroom or on a on the wall of a facility, right? And that's just the super level, the, the whole thing. And any one of these, you could imagine how, it would, how different this would be if we said we wanted to put this in the form of a pamphlet instead, or if it would be a little card or a little uh, panel next to the soap dispenser, let's say. Well, you'd have to change the entire document. Uh, so these are all different levels. I'd probably start with the supra and then uh, maybe uh, go backwards from there, but hopefully that gives you an idea of these different levels. All right, and here's some more document design guidelines. Uh, the use of white space, uh, just so crucial. And people, especially when they're putting together, say, PowerPoints, uh, they tend to want to just overload that sucker with text. They just want to have stuff everywhere, pictures, you know, stuff going off, popping, <laughs> you know, 10 points on a single slide. And, of course, it looks terrible, right? Uh, really, if you when you want to focus people's attention, uh, you just have some text out with a lot of space around it. This is blue, but I know it's kind of confusing, but we would call all this emptiness around this white space. It might be more accurate to call this empty space or just use a blank space, because uh, what it does, it kind of draws the viewer in. So right now we just have a little bit of text here and lots of white space. So you really focus in on this point, use white space, and then you might look up there to the document design guidelines uh, but you see, this is very effective. We're bringing in the points one at a time. Uh, we're using the white space wisely. Uh, another point is, of course, to use headings. And you're kind of locked into this with PowerPoint. It sort of makes you put a title. We could call that a heading. Uh, but again, we, we, thought, we talked about the menu before and having appetizers, main dish, desserts, or a resume. You know, that'll have the uh, work, work history. Um, Education makes it easy. Uh, limit words set in all capital letters. I, I strongly discourage this. You know, putting when you're using all caps, it looks great on a building. It looks, you know, if it's a tombstone, fine. Uh, use all caps. That's your graveyard. <laughs> That's your gravestone. <laughs> uh, resume, it doesn't, it shouldn't be there. Uh, we don't want to be yelling at people. Uh, we don't want to be making something hard to read. So I wouldn't use that. There's many other ways to set something. You can put it in bold, different color, uh, lots of different ways to set it apart other than these uh, all caps. Now, use no more than two fonts uh, per document. I think this is pretty good advice. Uh, sometimes people get carried away and they got one font over here, another font over there, another font over here. I mean, imagine that menu again. If somebody said, well, you know, I think we should have one font for the appetizers. And when we get to the main dish, let's have another font. And when we get to the sides, let's have another font. All that's going to do is look like you were some kid that was just going crazy <laughs> with the fonts. It's not going to make it look more professional. Just it'd make it look childish, basically. Uh, so just or, or worst case scenario, uh, they think, well, they accidentally used another font. Uh, they thought they were using the same font, but I can see it's, it's slightly different over here. Uh, that, that looks even worse. Just looks terrible. Now here's a couple other points. Justify margins selectively. So what they're talking about here uh, with the uh, with the word processor, you can you can set it so that your text, as you're writing paragraphs, it kind of looks like this, right? And if you look over here at the right side, you'll notice it's, it's kind of what do you call it, uh, jagged or uh, rugged. Right? What's the word? Um, I guess jagged is the word. I forget what the exact term is for this, but uh, you see it doesn't quite line up nicely. Uh, whereas if you're using the, the full justification, uh, then it will exactly line up. Now the problem with this is, you might it's got some pluses, but uh, the problem is that word processors don't properly hyphenate. So to do this uh, professional typesetter, you know, there's a reason they get, that's, that's a job, right? That's, that's a career. 
uh, because you can't just automate the hyphenations of words very well. If you try this, you'll end up with weird uh, hyphenations. I don't really want to get all into it. Uh, either that or it'll have, uh, you know, big gaps, weird sort of gaps in there uh, to try to f make that uh, full of justification. So if these are short words, they might have a lot of empty space there uh, so they can fit that big word over there on the right and make it line up. Uh, and this right here, uh, again, can make it look uh, sloppy looking. Uh, again, the professional typesetters will be able to hyphenate words and they do little subtle things to make it look nice, but this is that's kind of way above the capability of just a humble word processor. So now, I think it is good just to use that selectively most of the time. People would rather have this sort of ragged look uh, than be dealing with huge gaps in the, in the middle of lines, right? That that just this is more distracting than just a little bit of you know, ruggedness, jaggedness on the side. Uh, put your key items at the top left or the bottom right. Uh, you can a good place to look at this. If you're just walking around campus, take a look at some of the flyers up or the uh, infographics or a, a website. You know they'll have the probably the menu at the top left or the or maybe the logo for the company up there. Uh, the bottom right. You know this is a lot of businesses, uh, a lot of business publications down here. You'll have uh, contact information down there. Uh, using the grid for Unity, um, uh, again, if you think about the page as a grid, and if you're using uh, <laughs> uh, if you're using software like PowerPoint, uh, sometimes it'll activate a grid for you, or with Word, you could turn it on. And this is a very sloppy approximation here, but when you turn that on, it, it helps you line up things. Because uh, one of the things that will drive people nuts is if you have a s slight offset stuff. So maybe there's something here, but over here it's just a little bit too low or too high. Uh, it doesn't quite line up. And a lot of people don't even notice this. They don't have that much precision with their eyesight, I guess, to see that that's, that's a little off. Uh, but other people, though, are, they'll see that right away and it'll just drive them crazy and they'll think this is really sloppy. Uh, so it doesn't. It's easy to turn on this grid, and that way you can make sure it's lined up. Or you could just use this kind of abstractly, thinking that, well, I want to have a, this. I'm going to divide this document into four sections, let's say, and uh, that'll help you decide where, where to put stuff. Uh, highlighting decorative devices and color in moderation. Uh, so the, the temptation here is, I tell students this all the time. I'll see the. I'll have students and they'll have a highlighter, a highlighter out and they'll have every everything on the page highlighted. It's just everything highlighted, right? And I say, why are you doing that? And I say, well, I'm, I'm highlighting this because it's important information and I want to make sure <laughs> that I remember it. <laughs> uh, but really, if you're highlighting everything, in a way you're highlighting nothing. Right? Because the whole point of highlighting is to make, it, is to make certain things contrast or stand out. And if everything is highlighted, then it doesn't do that anymore, right? Uh, so you might have one thing highlighted, but that's effective. But if everything is, it's ineffective, right? Uh, decorative devices and color uh, in moderation. So it's the same thing with these. Uh, little decorative devices. Sometimes on the menu, you might see the little chef special, let's say, and they might have a cute little chef hat there. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but if everything has that next to it, again, it kills the per defeats the purpose. Uh, colors, this kind of goes back to using a lots of fonts, right? So if I've got 17 different colors on my menu, it, just, it looks like somebody went nuts. Doesn't look professional. Look, looks cheesy. All right, in these slides, uh, I'm going to skip through these because we, we've already covered this content. I will see if there's anything new here. Uh, it's just this one's about the white space. Uh, they got an example here, I guess, that kind of shows you how you could use that to break a document into sections visually. Uh, they also talk here about headings and uh, mixing the paragraph lengths. Uh, I will stop here for a second and talk about this point. Uh, I, a lot of students struggle with this. Uh, they'll either have a page, and the whole page is just one giant paragraph. Uh, that looks terrible. Uh, or they might have little bitty paragraphs and just tons of them. Uh, neither one of those are great. Uh, what's really more effective is to have a balance 
you know, this is a pretty good example here. Now, this is particularly important with the introduction paragraph. If you have this huge paragraph right off, the, right at the st uh, start, uh, people just skip the document. They, they, nobody's got time for that. Uh, so keep the intros short and sweet. Uh, same thing with the conclusion, uh, conclusions, uh, short and sweet. Uh, but try to avoid just huge paragraphs. I mean, a lot of people struggle with that. A list of parallel items um, in the same format. So some menus, they'll have uh, maybe under appetizers, they'll have a little bulleted list, you know, wings, uh, onion blossom, uh, you name it there. And you wouldn't make sense to just keep varying the, You could if you change the font for those, that wouldn't make sense. Spacing wouldn't make sense. Uh, a parallel, uh, to make this point a little more uh, uh, clearly though, let's, let's imagine you had a menu or uh, let's say you had a uh, set of instructions, right? And the first instruction was uh, step one, uh, apply the filter. Well, when you set it up that way, the, the next one should say something like step two, check the status. So again, it's the same verb format every time, about the same length on those. Uh, if I do have a decorative item like a bullet point out there, I'm using the same one each time. That just means keeping it parallel. And a further point on that is with bullets. So the bullet, I'm sure you know what those are. They're just little dots. Uh, those are great if it doesn't matter what order the information is is in. Uh, so up here, you know, wings, onion rings, uh, or onion blossom, uh, whatever. It doesn't really matter what order that is in. Uh, on the other hand, if it's uh, instructions, it matters a great deal, right? You have a step one, a step two, a step three. Uh, so for that, you don't want to use just bullets. Uh, you want to have numbers instead. And, and don't make the mistake of using, trying to use bullets with numbers. You know, that's just redundant. Uh, so either use bullets if the order doesn't matter, or use the numbers uh, if, it, if it does matter. And it's just, that's just a simple matter in your word processor. Uh, if you click on the when you're making the bullets, you can select the uh, numbered list instead, or you might right click on it. Uh, different word processes are different, but anything you're using will have those options. And here's some more about headings. Um, you can think about the heading like the title here, or I guess you could count that as a heading since it's in bold. And it, these are just little uh, words, uh, short phrases. Uh, those are great. You don't really want uh, sentence long headings, you shouldn't have punctuation with them, uh, periods on them. Uh, sometimes people will use questions for headings, like what do I need to know first, question mark. Uh, that could be a good heading. Uh, the key though, I think, is really to keep these short. Uh, again, if they're too long, uh, you kind of defeat the purpose. Uh, grouping points, dividing the document. Uh, we talked about this several times already, but yeah, appetizer, main dish, etc. Uh, showing organization, uh, this is a, this is nice here. Uh, again, one of the goals of business communication isn't just to be clear, but uh, to, to kind of show that you're taking it seriously, you value the person's time, uh, you've taken the time to organize this document well, and that can come across just by the use of effective headings. Uh, helping the audience, saving time. Uh, again, if I want to get to that dessert menu, I shouldn't have to spend, I shouldn't have to be looking in a giant paragraph uh, trying to find where the hell do they start talking about <laughs> the desserts? Uh, it'll help people out, the, all this stuff. And, and I see it all the time. You know, I was just looking the other day at this at this uh, course curriculum revision sheet and they were they had a list in there of the courses they wanted to require for this program. Right? It's just one giant paragraph with all the courses, and there were numbers in there, like you know three or four things. But it was just a giant block, and everybody hated it. It was just taking us forever to find any information. So just a couple of seconds, really, uh, to put that information into a uh, bulleted list or a numbered list, or just just to have some headings on it, like. Uh, Required courses, electives, uh, suggested courses even. Uh, that would have made it tremendously more effective. Uh, making the page uh, look more interesting. Uh, that, I guess, uh, what do they mean there? I, I guess uh, I guess it does make it look more, I would say, appealing. 
<laughs> more, more than interesting. Uh, we don't want to look at those giant blocks of text. Uh, if we do have it divided up nicely, it's it's uh, more appealing. But I guess some possibly more interesting too. I'm not really sure what what they're going for there. Uh, so let's see. How do we create a heading? Uh, they say to make each one specific. Uh, this is a problem you might run into uh, with certain documents, and this this is why I suggest outlining, uh, so you can start thinking about how you can avoid overlap, or have categories where it seems like it's could cover two or three different things. Uh, you not you don't have mutually exclusive categories, uh, for example. Uh, so it's just putting some thought into a heading and and how you can make that uh, specific. Uh, we've talked about parallelism already, but we, we see it here. So make each specific, keep parallel. So you see this, this is make each specific. If we got to the second one and it was keeping everything parallel, uh, that wouldn't be parallel. Or if it said you should keep everything parallel, uh, that's not parallel. So it's it's really, you, could, you can get technical with it. Uh, why bother? Uh, just read it out loud, get a feel for the sound of it. Make each specific keep parallel. Uh, when you do that, you can sort of get a feel uh, for how it's uh, for something that's parallel versus uh, one that doesn't fit. Uh, make sure they cover all material until the next heading. Uh, this is uh, one of the reasons I this is stressed so much with resumes. If you have uh, a section there called work experience and another section somewhere that you want where you want to talk about uh, no, well, let's say uh, internships. Um, you don't want to start bleeding stuff that really should be in the work experience uh, down there or leaving it up there. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So again, this is stuff that can be easily avoided if you just plan this out first. Uh, so here's some more information about the all caps. I'm not sure you know what that means, but they, they say if you do it, you lose the unique shapes of the words. Uh, so that's, uh, if you think about how everything in all caps, it kind of is all spaced out. I'll show you, we'll have a, oh, there we go. Uh, here's the uh, the visual to show you this. So you see, that was just a block, and you you have less visual cues to be able to make out what that word is uh, than when it's lowercase like this. And I think that's pretty self-evident uh, why the one that's in lowercase is easier to, to see, because uh, there's different heights, basically. Uh, with this one, everything is the same height. You lose a little bit of a, a visual visuality. <laughs> is that a word? <laughs> uh, yeah, the same rectangular shape. Uh, they called them. Uh, that's kind of fancy. Ascenders and descenders. So I guess that L stands up a little bit, ascending over that line, and then the little uh, feet on the P's uh, go below it, uh, causing the reader to slow down, causing more reading errors. So I guess we, we kind of I kind of joked around about how you see all caps on buildings or on uh, tombstones, and I guess that makes sense because you do want the reader to slow down there. It's not about uh, rapid, efficient uh, communication there. I mean, the whole idea is to be uh, reverential, uh, or they really want you to you know <laughs> before you enter the building, you, you kind of want to slow down and see what the name of the building is, make sure it's the right building. <laughs> uh, but I guess it could cause more reading errors. Uh, that's why these, you know, usually you don't have a long name for a building, right? It's, you know, the Miller Bill, Miller Center. It's not the Miller Center for blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and going on for a paragraph and all caps. That would be kind of pointless. You know, look, look pretty, pretty uh, terrible. Uh, a little bit more about the fonts. You know what a font is. I don't <laughs> It's hard to find people that don't know what a font is. It's just the way these letters look. Uh, however, a little bit more obscure is the this idea of a serif font versus the sans serif. Uh, so they say the serif's font uh, has feet on it. And what that means is if you look up here, we've got N's and M's, and they have little kind of platforms or feet on those letters. Uh, so that is a serif font. They're easier to read, and they're great for paragraphs because they kind of connect uh, the words better. Uh, here's some examples. New courier, so you can really see that foot on the end there. 
Times New Roman is a little bit more subtle, but you can still see it's got feet. And then the sans serif, the word uh, sans just means without. I see these are letters that don't have feet. Hope they don't have a long way to go. Uh, harder to read on the one hand, but they are uh, used for headings and tables. And again, that's because the headings should be short. So you shouldn't have to spend a lot of time reading. So it's, it's okay to use them there. And here's some examples of those. Uh, Arial, Tahoma, so you see there's no feet on those. Uh, universe. You know, I haven't heard of that font before. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they don't have little planks under the end. All right, so some more info information about fonts. Most documents just use the one font. However, you can create emphasis with uh, using a bold font. Now, the designers will kill you if you do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've published uh, several books at this point, and, and they really don't uh, like it when you're using lots of bold. Uh, what they prefer instead is for you to use a different font. Uh, so if you have a, uh, if you look at Word, they'll have, uh, was it Calibri? And then they have another font called Calibri Bold. Uh, what, what, it, what, what it means is that if you just use bold on your word processor, it just fattens up the, the letter. And sometimes it looks fine, but sometimes it just looks cumbersome. It looks a little cheesy. Uh, they have a version of the font called Calibri Bold where they, they go in and they really kind of fine tune it uh, so that it looks nice when it's uh, fattened up. Uh, italics, the same, the same deal. Uh, they, uh, the better word processors have different fonts. So you can't just go over there and say, put that in italics. Uh, you want to use the change the font to the italics version of the font. Uh, but really, the, I would put these in the same category with the highlighting. If, if everything's italics, every, you know, nothing is, is italicized, right? It's the same idea. You, sparingly is better. <laughs> Varied sizes. Uh, so most of the time, uh, you wouldn't see this. This looks incredibly goofy here. Uh, you'd never do this. Uh, but you definitely want to have your heading being a little bigger uh, uh, than the rest of the text. Yeah, sure, you see that a lot. And then they give you the general guideline of 12-point font being ideal for most business documents. This is really more important for the uh, printed stuff. Um, if it's a website or any kind of app, electronic document, uh, the users can control have a lot more control over the size of these fonts. Uh, so it's, it's not really a big, it's not so important uh, the point anymore. What's important is the uh, percentage, the percentages or the ratios. Uh, so you'll have a heading one and a heading two and a heading three, let's say. And you might say you want to make the, uh, these levels. Uh, this one is 100% big. Uh, this one is 75%. Uh, this one's 50%. You know, so it works more like that uh, than it does just picking individual points. Yeah, headings may be larger. <laughs> uh, all right, so again, with the full justification, uh, text is even at the left and right margin. Uh, we see that here. It's most, most of the times it's left justified, but that one's just an example where it's both. Uh, it's very formal looking. It does uh, use uh, fewer pages. Uh, ragged, yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Ragged right margin. Uh, this is far more typical. Yeah, you do have the little gaps there, uh, but nevertheless, it's it's more common. and They call it informal. I don't know. Uh, I guess it might look a little bit less formal than this, but it, it's far more typical. Uh, using very short lines. Want to revise uh, selected pages. Want, want to revise selected pages. I don't even know what they mean there. Uh, and here's some stuff at the uh, about these quadrants. And this is kind of interesting how they, they've done a lot of work with eye tracking software. And so they have these little glasses or little cameras they can mount on a monitor and they can tell where the person is looking at on a page. And they find that you might think, well, you always start at the left and go over here and then go over here and it's kind of like that. Uh, really, nobody reads like that in real life. And it's more like this, this Z pattern, right? This is really mysterious. They find that most people, or most of the time, you only see about maybe 40% of the words. 
and you're just kind of imagining your, your brain just kind of fills in the rest uh, it's not and sometimes it's, there's words that you imagine are there that aren't even really there it's just really bizarre stuff uh, but anyway it's, it's very useful to know this uh, so starting at the left corner you know we'll start when you looked at this slide you probably looked up there first right upper left uh, reads to the right and then down and so when you think about this z uh, you can imagine where you're going to end up at the bottom right now where do you start at the top left uh, so that's why they're, they're stressing those points is because of this z pattern now oh here's some nice examples of the grids we were talking about earlier uh, so you see how they have put this one into two columns and this is relatively easy to set up with microsoft word you, there's a little option there called columns or if you're using powerpoint when you do a slide you can change the uh, layout of the slide to a two column or three column uh, this one's kind of getting busy right so you have to put some thought in, into how big the page is going to be is this a poster is it a little pamphlet uh, it make a huge difference uh, grid two or three imaginary columns on page may be subdivided uh, so you see how, there how they're using the columns in conjunction with the headings and with the, the white space and I guess there's probably going to be a picture there uh, where that X is. Um, and they're basically just subdividing everything and lining it up into columns. Now, so here's the reason you might be wondering why bother with this? Uh, well, it does create symmetry, kind of a visual balance there. And it, if you have this long, long document, you know, something like this can make it a little easier to parse. Uh, so I guess you might want, like a newspaper, for example, they don't have the line going all the way across that page. I mean, that'd be crazy. Uh, it's a big page, so they just have little columns, and then they'll have, you know, maybe three, four, however big. You know, I don't know how many columns, <laughs> uh, but at the very minimum, two, and then they'll have it broken up into grids, so kind of like this. So you might have a different set of stories over on that side. Uh, decorative devices. Uh, they use the word dingbat what a word huh uh, but you I've heard, I've heard them called wing dings <laughs> or clip art you know a little hand little scissors there a little ribbon uh, these are great i love them you, know, you see them on menus a lot uh, it's great but again the idea is if you use too many of them or use them every time it just it's like you're not using them at all uh, color uh, in North America, red usually means danger. Uh, yeah, I guess that's right. So the they talked a little bit in the book about how some different cultures use colors differently. Uh, I'm pretty sure that in Japan, I think I've heard that uh, the color black there uh, means happy. Uh, whereas, of course, here you think uh, somebody in all black means they're in mourning or something sad has happened, right? Um, same thing with red so th these are culturally bound things so red here might mean danger or I think of yellow meaning caution uh, but you go to a different uh, country different geographic location that might be uh, the opposite all right so here we're talking about brochures and some general advice for designing them obviously we start by that rhetorical situation uh, yeah what is the central selling point what is the key piece of information that you want to convey in that brochure and it's going to probably cost a lot of money and time to make this thing and print it out you know, thousands of copies perhaps so you really <laughs> it really pays to put a lot of thought into the planning phase of it so we know what the, the central selling point might be possible objections uh, ways to handle those objections uh, well, let's just think about if we thought about the menu uh, as a brochure uh, we could think there well the central selling point of a dish uh, might be the high quality or the, maybe it's a fresh item uh, so one of your menu items is made fresh uh, made to order right so that's a good selling point uh, objections and ways to handle them. well maybe the uh, one of the objections might be that it's uh, high in calories oh, let's say 
<laughs> and so to, to deal with that, maybe you want to uh, pair it with the salad as a side instead of the fries. You know, I'm just kind of making stuff up there, but you get the idea. Now consider how the audience will get the brochure and where they will use it. So again, with the menu, we talked about the lunch menu, uh, the dinner menu. Uh, but other kind of brochures, I've used this example probably over, I've probably overused it at this point, uh, but the, the safety information in the airport or the airplane. You, you're pulling out that brochure there about how to use the uh, life vest <laughs> or the oxygen mask or whatever, how to buckle yourself in. Uh, that's a very particular situation. And you need to be thinking about that as you're designing the brochure. And draft the text. Uh, so really the key there is just, you've done the planning first, now you're drafting. Uh, selecting the appropriate visuals, uh, choose the visuals that tell a story. Uh, so with the uh, that airport, they do put it in kind of, almost kind of a comic book-like uh, format. So you have people there putting on their seat belts or putting on, there comes the auction mask, uh, they put on the mask. It's kind of telling a story. Uh, you could just think about a comic book there. Uh, with a menu, I don't know if it would work so well. Um, I guess you could have pictures there of, of somebody eating a burger. <laughs> that kind of tells a story. Um, uh, make sure the word, uh, visuals work for the audience. You know, what kind of people are you showing in the um, ads? They give some pretty interesting examples in the book. I forget where it was located, but they were talking about this operations manual and they had uh, women women's hands uh, operating all of the different devices and uh, they were talking about how that might be impressive right you might think well this is great you know i'm, I'm glad to see some diversity <laughs> uh, but on the other hand maybe it might send a message that uh, th this is only appropriate uh, for women or something like that uh, so if that's true that's one thing but it could be a miscommunication uh, creating the design of the document, using the proportional fonts, uh, we, we've talked about those, and you don't want to use the courier. Uh, using the two fonts for visual variety, so a different font for the heading is fine. So you might have the heading and the body font, perfectly fine. Avoiding italic type and underlining. I wouldn't say so much avoid it as just uh, make sure that you really need it and that it's appropriate. Uh, underlining, uh, though, I don't, I, I use it for this purpose, just to kind of draw on the slide, but uh, it, it really doesn't really look very good. Um, they use it, it's kind of funny, they say avoid italic type, and look look there, they're using the <laughs> italic type. Uh, but maybe, maybe this in the context of a brochure, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, use color effectively. I mean, that's great advice. On the other hand, don't use color ineffectively. <laughs> I'm kind of joking around about this, but uh, again, you know, the, the color red, you know, people associate that with danger or with, uh, you know, make, uh, if you get a, your essay back and it's got red ink on it, it kind of means you've done something wrong. And so you would, you probably wouldn't want to use red on the, on the menu. Uh, at least at the very least, you'd really need to think about that. Uh, repeating the design elements. Uh, so with our brochure, uh, we wouldn't want to have uh, one set of headings and, and one set of uh, fonts on one page, and then the next part of it be completely different. You know, that would look uh, very amateurish. Uh, creating contrast. Uh, we, we've talked about how you could even do that by doing nothing, simply by having a, a blank spot on the pamphlet or uh, the brochure that can create some contrast, right? So if we have this, uh, maybe this is the front page of our brochure, and maybe all we have is just one one line there. Uh, maybe this is safety. <laughs> uh, that by We created contrast by not putting a bunch of junk uh, on the rest of that page. Uh, but you could also use the bigger font, uh, the different color, the highlighting, the bold, etc. Yeah, include plenty of white spacing. <laughs> <laughs> already covered that. Uh, last stage, printing the brochure. Uh, so really, the, the you know, you, you've probably heard stories about people that have 
plan weddings or parties, big festival, big, you know, big sort of graduation parties, whatever. And they didn't do this stuff. They didn't plan it well. They didn't proofread it. Now they've got 500 copies and it's, it's got some big problems in terms of design, but it's too late now. They've printed it. So they can either print it, have it printed again and cost all that money, uh, which is a big issue. Probably get you fired if you're you know, spent wasting uh, company resources like that. So really the idea is uh, <laughs> make sure you've done steps one through four before you, before you even think about sending this to the print, printer. Uh, now we're getting into the infographics and everybody loves infographics. You see these all over campus. And it's really this, a very similar thing to the brochure, uh, analyzing that rhetorical situation. You know, who's going to, what's the purpose of it? Who's going to see it? Where's it going to be? Uh, how big is it going to be? What are you trying to, what's your key selling point? All, all the same stuff. Uh, obviously you want to research your topic. Uh, you don't want to be putting up erroneous information. Uh, finding or creating visuals. Uh, so this will be key. It's, it's an infographic. It's not just information. It's infographic. Uh, where do you get those visuals? Uh, same step with the drafting the text and then putting it together. Uh, this is really the challenge is figuring out how do you coordinate the pictures with the text. Uh, web pages. They, they say there the first step is to attract and maintain attention. Uh, obviously, the, you got the, they call it the World Wide Web. <laughs> this, I guess, a pr practically infinite number of web pages. Uh, what can you do to make yours stand out? Uh, you really need to be focusing in. If they're if they're going to be looking at your site for 30 seconds, you know the book says about half people, uh, half the people that come to your site will only spend about 30 seconds looking at. It. Uh, so that's, that's really uh, important to consider that short attention span and what can you do to make sure that they see the important stuff on your page. Uh, creating a usable home page there, what does that mean? It means that it needs an introductory statement to orient the audience. Uh, so again, you think 30 seconds, if you're just, you go to this web page, um, what are you thinking? You're like, what is this page? Is this page for me? Uh, does this page have information that I need? That's the kind of question going on in your mind. Uh, and if you take longer, if it's taking you a couple of minutes to find that out, uh, you're just going to move on to the next page. Uh, make completing tasks easy. Uh, this is one of the reasons I object <laughs> uh, to D2L, uh, because it seems like a lot of the times just something that should be so simple, either for teaching or for you as a student, ends up taking like three or four steps and is confusing. Uh, you don't want that. Uh, and it's not like, I'm not blaming D2L, it's not like they're a terrible company, because you, you saw the same thing with like the, uh, I remember back when this Obamacare stuff was going on, and, and they had spent like millions, they, they paid people millions uh, to design these websites in just like simple little stuff, uh, like signing up, seeing if you're eligible, or seeing what kind of uh, benefits are offered, uh, or even just registering on the, the site. Uh, ended up being way more complicated uh, than it ever should have been. And it kind of just gave the whole process a, a bad name. Uh, so they really kind of dropped the ball in, in terms of designing those pages in a major way. Uh, offering the overview of the site's content, uh, I would really just put that under the same uh, category as introducing the site. And finally, providing navigation bars. So you notice when we were talking about the pamphlets and the infographics, we talked about headings. Well, this is really just the same kind of principle here. You've taken this giant catalog, right? And you've broken it, broken it into headings. So business, uh, earth and environmental science. Uh, so this is uh, just a way to break up this content, make it a little bit easier to navigate this giant site. Uh, make it clear what the audience will get if they click a link. Well, let's let's just see. What, what do you think? Uh, would we know what we were going to get if we clicked on one of these? Uh, it does say there, catalog. So we know we're looking at a catalog. And then it says specialty catalog <laughs> and then main catalogs. Uh, so we know we're looking at the main catalogs. So allied health. Uh, I'm not really 100% sure what I would get there. I don't really know what allied health means, uh, but I do know uh, I'm going to get a catalog of textbooks. 
uh, about that topic. And so th I think this is a pretty effective design then, because even if I don't necessarily know what uh, that means, I do know what kind of stuff I'll get when I click the link. Uh, and that's the key. And I suppose uh, they're banking here that whoever needs that material would know what Allied Health is already. Uh, this is not a website for total noobs. <laughs> you know, I need, uh, let's say I need English, uh, so I can scroll down here and find uh, English. Well, that's English as a second language, right? So that's not quite right for me, so I'd have to, you know, bounce around the site a little bit more, see if I could find where their uh, just a regular old English is. Uh, designing web pages continued. Uh, providing easy navigation. Uh, we just covered that, but a little bit more. Uh, intuitive and make accessing information easy. Uh, so Steve Krug has a good book about this, and he calls it Don't Make Me Think. So if I'm on the, coming back to this healthcare uh, website, hey, I need to know, I need to register, I need to create an account on this site, I need to find out what kind of options are available. Well, you should know that's the most, you know, if you're the designer of that website, you need to know that's just the most everybody's going to need to do that so i shouldn't have to make them jump through a bunch of hoops uh, make it confusing make them go through multiple steps uh, i should really design it so that basically you don't even have to really think if you go to that website there should be a big button there right <laughs> register on the site bada boom you just really quick click on it you get to the next day uh, the next part of that site and again this should all be easy enough for a child basically uh, to do this stuff it, on the other hand if you got some complicated mumbo jumbo and a big banner flashing there and you kind of have looking all over the page like where the heck is registration and uh, how do i create an account uh, what does this mean uh, that, that's terrible navigation at that point yeah if, if audience has to work too hard they will leave and they're right to leave right because uh if they're if they're having to work so hard uh, that means that the people doing this website didn't care about them enough uh, to put the time into de uh, designing that page uh, increasing accessibility uh, thumbnails show sample web page uh, designs uh, so i guess they're just saying here that a page like this where you have the headings up there home about us method services you got another menu here um, these are basically templates uh, you can download and apply. Uh, you know, a lot of us, we don't really have a lot of design training, uh, so you're better off using one of these templates. But I find that there's almost always something that doesn't quite work about a template. You need to customize it somehow. Uh, so there's a bit of a trade off there. Uh, following the conventions of a website, you've, you've been to plenty of websites, uh, you know what to expect. That's just called the conventions. Like basically, what do you expect a website to look like? Uh, using the white or light background uh, for scanning. Uh, you don't see too many websites with a black background, for example. Uh, keeping the graphics small. I remember there was a tendency there for a while where you'd go to a website and then be this giant flash animation thing movie that would just it would take a while to load and then it would pop up and just automatically start playing and it'd be noisy. And I didn't like that. I kind of got rid of that. <laughs> and so now if you've got little graphics, they're kind of small. And this is especially important, too, because uh, with the a lot of people use the, their phones now uh, to look at websites. And, you know, that giant picture uh, will probably just make all your text hard to find. And they'll have to be thumbing around that this big picture. So it's just not, not good practice anymore, if it ever was. Uh, providing the visual variety in the text, and we talked about this already, but uh, with the uh, you could use that grid to think about how you'd want to lay that out. Uh, the different kinds of uh, a heading has a different font than the rest of it. Using good paragraphing, etc. Uh, unify multiple pages with graphic elements. Uh, so they don't tell you what the graphic element is here, uh, but this could be everything from a color theme, color scheme for your website. If you go to the St. Cloud State uh, website, for example, you, you can tell you're on the same campus looking at St. Cloud State pages uh, because they all have the same color scheme, same font selections, uh, the same. They got two or three different layouts, but they're not so different than each other. 
it's not like when you're on the St. Cloud website, you're clicking around, you're looking at different links, and you don't get to a point where you're like, whoa, <laughs> am I on a completely different site? It looks completely different. Uh, no, you don't do that. And St. Cloud State spent a lot of money to make sure you don't have that problem, right? And that's, that's the whole business with the theme. Uh, using alternative text, uh, this is something that gets overlooked a lot. But if you do have graphics, if the graphics are just for decoration, that's one thing. Uh, but if you have an important, if you're having important information being conveyed in the form of an image, well, that's going to be a problem for people that are uh, that lack vision. So people might be using a screen reader, and the screen reader won't be able to interpret what's what you're trying to convey in that image. So if I got some picture here, uh, maybe it's a map or something, right? Uh, something being conveyed visually. I have to provide some alternative text. Uh, preferably, um, this would be text that would tell the uh, person basically what is this image and what what's important about it. Why is it there? At the very least, uh, it should basically think about an alternative to vision. So if I if I can't see the picture, but I still need the information, I need uh, that information to be presented to me in an alternative form, namely text. Uh, providing a link uh, to the home page on each page, yeah, this is a, this is a big one. Uh, you don't want to get off on a website and then figure get lost and say, how do I get back? How do I get back? There's no home page button. Um, it's just standard stuff. Everybody does that. <laughs> Animation to a minimum. Uh, we kind of talked about this. This is why I think uh, Apple was, was pretty smart not to include Flash uh, on their web browsers for their phones. Like, they just kind of killed it because, and it was really, I'm, I'm glad it died because <laughs> uh, it was just so annoying uh, when you just want to, you want to go to a page, you don't want to watch a, a movie play just to get to a menu and stuff moving and flashing. and It's just garbage. Uh, you just want to be able to quickly get there, navigate to where you want, save yourself time. Um, so, yeah, they tell you keep animation to a minimum, but Apple kind of forced you to. Allow users the option to turn off music or sound effects. You, I just say don't even, you know, unless you've got, unless the site is like a sound effects site, <laughs> or you know obviously if you maybe it's a band page and you're trying to show your music uh, that's one thing but otherwise man uh, that is just really annoying when you're sitting there trying to uh, quietly surf the net and stuff just keeps blaring at you uh, really annoying all right and then lastly some stuff about uh, usability uh, so how do you test for this i mean it's one thing to say yeah uh, make your website accessible. Uh, make it easy to navigate. Uh, well, and then this is the problem. T and I run into this all the time. Students will say, uh, well, look, it is easy to navigate. Uh, you just click here, you click there, you click there, and bada boom. Uh, well, that's because you designed the site. You know where to click because you <laughs> designed the site. It doesn't matter that it's easy for you to do it. Uh, that's besides the point. Uh, what matters is your audience. Uh, the person using the site uh, is important for them. So, so that, you know, if, if, I, if this website is set up so that people can um, for, uh, register for classes, or if it's a D2L page and you're trying to tell if, if that, the purpose of that page is for them to be able to post a discussion, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter that it's easy for the programmer to do it. It's important that in that case for students to be able to do it. So. Uh, this is really key, and I wish people would do this more. Test for the usability. And it could be as simple as, say, uh, you know, if it's a restaurant. Let's say you have a, if you go to a Val's here in town, uh, it's kind of interesting, little burger joint. Uh, they have these uh, uh, panels. <laughs> you don't go to the, for, for whatever reason, you don't go to the uh, person working there and order your food. Uh, and just tell them what you want. You have to go to these little panels and, and click your food. And that's actually, I, I like the way they have these little uh, menus laid out on the thing. Because, I mean, it's just so <laughs> easy. <laughs> you know, it's like, what do you want? And they got like burger and uh, milkshake. You know, and you click, let's say you click milkshake. And then it takes you to another page and you see pictures of the milkshakes and the names of the shakes. And then you click it, you push it once or you push it again if you want two of them. Uh, I think that's, or I think it might have a little plus and a minus there uh, with a the number. Uh, but anyway, it's really easy to use. 
Now imagine this though. Uh, imagine there, those people are, are working there. They're looking at these people over here at the panels, and everybody's cursing, and there's there's some God, oh, why am I had to come over here and help me do this? Uh, well, at that point, you know you have failed with the panel. Um, it should be that when you're watching someone use it, they're uh, if not enjoying it, at least not having undue pain. And th there's only one way to figure it out. Again, the designer can't do this uh, by him or herself. They have to actually take the time to watch somebody do it. And it could be as simple as saying, uh, if, I don't know who did the vowels thing, but if, if I was the, if I owned vowels and I was trying to test out these panels, uh, I would probably just bring in some people. I'd say, look, there's a free meal in this for you. <laughs> you get a free milkshake. Uh, I just want you to come here and do three or four things for me. Uh, order a burger with, without onions. You know, uh, order two or uh, two two sides of fries. So you're just giving them sample tasks, and then you're just just watching them and not helping them. It d defeats the purpose if you have to jump in and say, "Well, uh, push that." <laughs> that defeat that's not that you're not going to be there when they're actually when somebody's really going to be using it. Uh, so you just have to let them figure it out, and you're just taking notes. Like, wow, it was really hard for this person to figure out how to. Uh, double that order of french fries. And, uh, yeah, ask user to think aloud during the task. Uh, this is hard for people to do. I, I don't know necessarily how useful it is, uh, but you could say, look, just kind of step me through what you're doing as you're doing it. Give me some insight into your thought process. Uh, so you might have the person say, uh, okay, I'm going to order a burger now. And I'm looking at the menu. I see a a button there that says burger. <laughs> Gonna press the button. Uh, oh no, it, it took me to a page uh, about french fries. Uh, how did I get there? I must have pressed something wrong. Uh, let me uh, see how I can go back. Uh, I can't find a back button. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'm kind of being a little, I'm sure it's not that bad, but uh, having them talk aloud like that will give you some insights into what might not be obvious. Uh, they tell you you can interrupt at key points uh, to find out what the user thinks. Yeah, maybe. Uh, on the other hand, you're, you're kind of uh, intruding a little bit. I don't know. You might be kind of uh, not getting a very accurate picture at that point because you are kind of uh, interrupting them. Uh, ask the user to describe thought process afterwards. Uh, so this can be nice. Uh, you know, once they've ordered their milkshake and they've gone through these steps, you could just say, well, you know, but did you like it? Was it tough for you? Did, was it frustrating? You know, uh, whatever. I just get kind of a general idea. Uh, the problem with this, though, is that they might have forgotten a lot of stuff along the way. Uh, maybe they forgot that they had to go back uh, two or three times uh, to order those fries and, and to get that just right. Uh, so really, for all these reasons, I would say the important thing is just to be watching them very carefully and taking notes as they do it. Because uh, when you just hear their briefing uh, or their summary of what it was like, they, they can forget stuff or make a big deal about something that really wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, for, web, for websites, uh, there's tons of software out there that will actually uh, record what people do on the site. So you can monitor, for example, uh, where they're clicking and how many times did they go back or how long did they spend on a certain page? And you can even get as sophisticated as to have the, that eye tracking software I was talking about. So it can use a webcam and look at their eyes and like see where they're looking at on a page. And you can you can do that. Uh, but this is kind of advanced stuff uh, for our purposes. I, I really don't think you need to be fancy with usability. Uh, I, I think it could just be just as simple as giving some people some tasks to do, it's just some standard stuff that anybody would be likely to do. Uh, watch them doing it, and then just keep some notes. Say, hey, well, it was really that took them 10 minutes to figure out uh, where the registration button was. That's a problem. Okay, we need to go back when we re uh, make our revisions. And we need to make sure we fix that. Uh, you know, on the other hand, if if people th just say, well, it it was uh, the button to increase the order of fries is a little small, uh, but you know nobody really seemed to have trouble with it. Nobody else seemed to have any trouble with it. Uh, maybe that would be lower down on your priority list. 
Ask a user to put plus and minus signs in the margins uh, to show uh, likes and dislikes. You know, I don't remember them talking about this one in the book, uh, but why not? You know, uh, you give them that panel, that menu to look at, automated menu. Uh, maybe they could just maybe have this printed out and say just write a little plus and a minus there. <laughs> uh, why not? This is kind of interesting. I never heard that one before. Uh, but anyway, I think the takeaway here is, is the first point. All right, so we're out of slides here. Again, a lot of information. Hopefully you found this useful. If you do have comments, questions, suggestions, you can put a plus or minus sign <laughs> about your likes and dislikes. Hey, uh, I love the feedback. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll get oh, out of your hair for now and see you next time.